Welcome back to The Deal Room, and we have a guest on the show this week. So, not Stephen, but Philip, who... I was trying to think, Philip, when I first met you, it was, I think it was 20, maybe 2015, 2016. So the years are stacking up. But the reason yep. why <laughs> this is going to be a great conversation is when I met you, you were a student kind of thinking about the application process. What job should I go for? You know, I think you were at the time, there's the LSC summer school or something like that was going Correct. on. And great so, <laughs> And so... Now, you've obviously spent some time working at a major investment bank on the sell side in, in banking, and now you're working on the buy side in private equity. I thought you'd be a great person to share some insights because there's a lot of students who are looking to follow that kind of path. There's probably lots of unanswered questions, but then I know you're also involved with a lot of the hiring processes and design of programs when you're at yes. uh, City, for example. So would love to jump into that. But Perhaps by way of introduction, you could give us a little short history of yourself. Would be great. Absolutely, thanks, Anthony, and and always great to uh, be chatting and and interacting with Amplify. Um, as you mentioned, I came across you guys in my second year of university. Um, I studied at Halt International Business School, which uh, has a campus. Uh, in London, including some other locations, but I spent all my time there essentially studying a bachelor's in business administration with concentration in finance. Um, and after that, I have uh, completed a summer internship with Citibank, Depp Capital Markets team in Hong Kong, um, decided to take the full-time return offer and then spent around three, three and a half years with a team in Hong Kong, um, focusing on both high yield investment grade bond origination, essentially. And after that, I decided it's time to switch things around a little bit. And I transferred to a real estate investment banking team here in London, um, spent around a year with the team and again, decided that it's time to switch things around a little bit more. And I changed to a private equity firm called Activum SG, which is a specialist real estate, uh, mid-market value add player. And uh, I'm with them at the moment for almost two years now. Yeah, so there's a lot to unpack there from being in different geographic areas to sell side, buy side, different roles. But perhaps um, we could start with the kind of the period of where we're at right now is a lot of people are waiting to hear back with offers still in an mm -hmm. application process. So how was that experience for you, if you could cast your mind back? Yeah, uh, I think stressful is uh, probably the first word that comes to my mind. Um, my university, as much as it was fun and great a learning experience because it was more of an American style with a lot of case studies, presentations, etc. It was a non-target school for finance roles. And so to whoever has to click other on the application form when they are filling their university name, um, I know how that feels. <laughs> And uh, because of that, you as a student had to do, let's say, um, more than let some others that were in more traditional targets, universities for finance. And, you know, one of those initiatives was, of course, uh, Amplify trading course that I did. Um, and then at the time, I also recognized that uh, name of a recognized university on a CV uh, is important, for example. So I did the uh, LSE summer uh, school course and I did some volunteering on the side as well just to differentiate myself a little bit um, but that's kind of uh, the experience it was quite a busy period because of course you are trying to juggle um, primarily the studies trying to maintain uh, good grades but also trying to kind of differentiate yourself study for the applications and uh, um, hopefully have some fun on the side as well. 
as a university student. So it was a quite, uh, quite uh, eventful period uh, for sure. And, 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 and indeed we'll, we'll go into the details uh, shortly, but I think overarchingly a comment would be if you feel confused, overwhelmed and stressed, uh, uh, that's certainly you're not alone. Yeah. So what, what was your, your tactic then? So coming from a non-target school, did you have to go higher volume and how then did you balance out the volume qu quality kind of yeah. balance? I think I, after first year where I came in to London and it took me that entire first year to kind of just understand and map out not only the realm of uh, opportunities in a different areas of finance, but also kind of gain that conviction that I want to go into finance and just figuring out the um, process, the application process, um, um, the spring weeks, the summer internships and that ladder. So I, I wouldn't say I lost the first year, but I was certainly uh, a little bit behind of the curve of, you know, the cohort that is uh, uh, super up to speed from day one at the major universities with, that has done spring weeks and introductory um, internships at some of the institutions. So for me, it was really uh, about going all out and really trying to do everything I can uh, to increase my chances. And in that regard, I essentially decided that I will try to maintain um, acceptable level of grades. Uh, in the end, uh, I managed to do relatively well, so um, that was okay. But in terms of a mindset, I was 100% focused on the applications and the summer internships as the priority number one. And that was just a function of uh, being in the non-target university at the time. I believe right now it's slightly better, but still uh, my recommendation would actually be if somebody is really uh, has that conviction that finance and investment banking, for example, or private equity, asset management, etc., are the career routes that they 100% want to try and they are currently non target university, uh, broadly defined, then the application process for summer internships or any kind of internships uh, should be priority. So that was a step number one in terms of kind of realizing the playing field, uh, if you will, and then finding different avenues um, to optimize the search. So I would say it is very important to first understand what it is about finance that excites you and what it is that you find interesting and which area actually is a priority number one. Is it really the M&A that everybody's talking about or actually are you more interested in the asset management of side of, of, of finance or trading? Um, and I think that prioritization helps a lot because I don't think you can apply to every single um, program that is out there um, and you will lose a little bit of a quality along the line as well, because uh, if you are focusing on too many things, then that it, it probably becomes too much uh, in terms of preparation um, and, and, and focus as well. So I think that's very important. And uh, for me personally, when I did the Amplify course back then, I think it was a one or two week course. And uh, at the time it was only focused on the uh, asset management and the trading and the hedge fund side of uh, the finance universe, a little bit of macro research as well, but there was not that much uh, on corporate finance and um, when Anthony, you sent me the presentation, um, which now includes corporate finance and various other areas of finance, I think it's incredibly useful to try it out. You will never get uh, to fully understand uh, until you try something, I think. So until you have that internship uh, and a first experience, you know, 
you can't hundred percent understand and 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 decide whether that is uh, the journey you should go. But at the same time, these kind of courses and experiences uh, give that give you a flavor do a massive thing because then you can decide. Okay, um, I will focus on one, two, and three areas, and I will develop an application system. And I will go after that. So that 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 helped massively at the time, and it just kind of sets you on a momentum as well. I did it conveniently. I think it was end of August or beginning of September, in terms of the timeline, and that was just perfect timing because it's start of application season. So you get up to speed with macroeconomics, which is a massive part of the application process, and it just sets you on a really good. Um, journey from there in terms of that momentum so i think that as a starting point is is critical and then you have a lot of great people from amplify that have substantial industry experience and now you interact a lot also with uh, you know hr departments etc where you will advise on cvs and how to kind of develop that system which kind of brings me to the next point uh, of reference and that kind of application system where you develop almost or hopefully actually um, specifically a spreadsheet for your applications where you list all the firms that you like or you could see yourself working for, what programs, internships they have to offer and then what is the deadline, how far you are in a process, because day one, it seems all uh, very clear and uh, you feel confident, you have visibility and you are aware, but but comes week three or four together with the studies and few university parties, uh, you lose track a little bit of where you are uh, at each stage of a process. Um, and. Hopefully you have, you know, you have applied to a lot of programs to increase your chances and it's just get, it just gets overwhelming. So if you, if you have a system within that application process, that will, that will serve as a kind of a, a stepping stone. Each time you sit down in a library or a cafe, you don't have to start from scratch and you don't feel like, oh, I don't know what to prepare for, but you have it clearly and planned so you can optimize that energy and time that is very limited um, during that process. So once you have that system and hopefully you get some first opportunities to, to speak uh, with people from the firms, you know, first round, second round interviews, um, largely today there is uh, actually a video recording first, but then it is uh, with actual person so once you have that system, I would advise to actually make sure that you have solid basics in terms of the priority areas that you are applying to, whether it's, uh, let's say, M&A, no very basic things, what that is, you know, how can a company acquire another company, what are very basic ways to value companies, etc so that you are not caught off guard because um, at the beginning it will be a lot of silence when you apply and then all of a sudden people start reaching out and you might have a lot of conversations scheduled in a narrow time frame so you want to be confident and have at least those basics in place so that you can then be more specific and let's say study the firm that you're applying to check out the background of the interviewer that will speak with you and just do a bit more work to come across more prepared. And I think that's uh, very much underestimated um, because a lot of people jump ahead of uh, the curve a little bit and they start to think, oh, how can I, you know, differentiate myself? How can I impress? And I will uh, deep dive on this uh, cool deal transaction or, or, or macro theme that I see in the news, but actually um, nailing the basics and coming across prepare is uh, important. 
Okay, cool. So let, let's uh, fast forward then and say you're on the internship because I think a lot of the students, rightly so, is the time of year, are so focused on that. It's almost yeah. like a sigh of relief. They get the offer, then they down tools, wait until the summer, and then they kind of go, all oh, right, now I'm here for 10 weeks. Now now what do I do? But you and I know that that 10-week period is, is a prolonged almost interview situation. So yeah. having you been on an internship as an intern, having you also work with HR to design an internship program, and then you also probably have line managed then their years yeah. thereafter interns. <laughs> so what advice would you give to them when they're on the internship itself? Yeah, um, great question. And there is a million ways to go about it, but I would label that internship as one unbelievable opportunity not only to hopefully get the full-time offer which should always be uh, the aim even though you might realize during the experience that <clears throat> it might not be ideal job for you uh, the aim for full-time offer should always be there uh, just in terms of credentials um, but you will be in a position of uh, amazing power from the day that you receive the offer and that power actually is to solicit and get, actually get meetings with a lot of people, a lot of senior people within the firm. Um, I remember uh, my experience and I remember a lot of interns having a mindset of uh, being a little bit bored and scared to be proactive. Um, and I think it might come to a little bit of a waste because as an intern, you will get majority of the coffee chat, lunch, uh, catch up requests that you ask for, because in minds of people, it's very different than when, for example, full-time analyst or associate reaches out um, a few years down the line. So I would advise to use that power to its full potential. And I'll just mention my personal experience slash story in, 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 a, in a summary. I've reached out to somebody from uh, adjacent team, not even my team of the internship that I was uh, going for. Um, I think it was two, three months after I got an offer. Um, but I just couldn't wait um, to interact with that environment. And I was so excited that <clears throat> I wanted to speak to somebody, ask some questions and just say, hey, uh, you know, once I'm uh, on the floor, it would be great to, you know, uh, meet in person, grab a coffee, etc." That person ended up on the uh, committee that was deciding who to retain for full time offers. And that person became uh, one of my really key mentors and great friends going forward. And I think that call, that random cold call, I would call it, was really a first step when the person realized, okay, this is a proactive uh, individual. And so it would be worth kind of my time to, to, to help them and uh, to interact with them. So little things like this can actually turn out to be massive or major uh, career movers. And then how about when you then start to go analyst kind of one, two, so yeah. that first one or two years, again, it's kind of the next evolution of that. You secured the role. What's the atmosphere like and how do you, with your other peers within your cohort, and then how do you navigate those first few years uh, in terms yeah. of your role? Do you stick with your role to master the technicals of that? Do you have accessibility to other roles, like you said, adjacent to that and other opportunities? How long do you give it before you start voicing those sorts of things? Yeah. Yeah. Good to get your, your take. Great question. Um, I would say, of course, with a caveat that's, uh, I will speak from experience of starting in investment banking and uh, specifically in a product team, which was Debt Capital Markets. Um, so, but I think 
it will be relevant across the board, uh, to be honest. So I think first year analyst still retains good degree of that great power to reach out to a lot of people and ask any kind of questions. Um, you cannot ask uh, stupid questions anymore. And unfortunately, actually, there are such questions as stupid questions. As an intern, there is unlimited uh, power to ask them. But as a first year analyst, um, not so much anymore. Um, then you still retain flexibility to kind of um, get away with uh, asking for help. And that you should definitely utilize as much as possible. Um, and I would say the key important thing is now you are on the job, whether it's your first choice, first priority in, in, in life or in career or not, sometimes it's not, or sometimes you're just unsure. I think the key most important thing is just to make sure that you do as good job as possible and really focus on what people expect from you. If it's unclear, feel free to clarify and, and make sure that you just deliver the best piece of work that you can. And even if it's not to the expectations or whatever of, of the surroundings, that's okay. I think it's more important to focus on that um, mindset and focus on that attitude rather than anything else because... Um, Coming from non-target university, not only it's a, a, a different dynamic, but also I felt I was a little bit behind in terms of, let's say, the technical knowledge um, that some other peers uh, in my analyst class had. Um, there were students with master's degrees, with various other internships uh, before at the comparable institutions. So... That technical part of job was always uh, a nuts to crack for me in the first uh, uh, eighteen months, and and I felt that big time. And you will enter a lot of periods where you feel under massive amount of pressure, and you you know you are battling a little bit in a self confidence, etc. But my strong recommendation would be to hang in there and try to do the best the best you can um, and people will realize soon that it's not just about them it's just the way how the industry is and at the end of the day uh, sooner or later the technical part of the job you will pick it up by just by nature of of uh, of doing it sooner or later so um, I wouldn't worry too much about it as as long as the attitude is right as long as the approach is right and we you can see the effort i would never um i would never let's say um i would never look uh in a bad way on on, on the juniors or the analysts uh, as as soon as you will uh start to show signs of uh let's say weaker uh attitudes where you know people can get frustrated with things etc then uh, I think that would be actually a, a, a bigger, bigger deal than uh, maybe not as, as great attention to detail, for example. Um, and just speaking of this, uh, a, a practical advice that I noted down when I was thinking about uh, what advice could I share is uh, twofold. So first, what I think is really uh, useful when you start working with somebody or when you land at a desk, ask that VP, director, associate, whoever you're working with, MD, doesn't matter. What is the best piece or a couple of pieces of work that they have recently seen? Whether it's a presentation, whether it's a model, uh, an email summary, whatever that is, and ask them to send that to you go through that and ask them afterwards, after you've gone through that, ask them um, what it is that you like about this piece of work. 
write that down, remember it, and every other project, every other task that you get after that, whether it's for same person or not, use that piece of work as a comparison. So I would do a presentation pitch to a, or a completely different client on one screen and I would have that best piece of work that somebody else has done before me, a superstar, analyst associate, whoever, on the other side. And even throughout the process, but especially at the end, I would go side by side, compare, review, and not only that will open up let's say a suggestions even for uh, a new analysis, new page to add, etc., which which people in banking love, you know, initiative and, and, and additional work. That's what people love. Uh, but also uh, maybe it's um, personal to me, but I think it's relevant uh, generally as well. Human brain works super well when you have a comparison or a benchmark against <clears throat> and so looking at let's say uh analysis uh some of the parts analysis for two completely different companies in different countries you would might you might think that that doesn't make much sense but just by comparing the two it will open up this process in the brain that will uh, pick up things that you would not otherwise so i think i think that is one practical um, advice that I use day to day, uh, even even uh, in my current job, I would review every single legal document or commercial document with a precedent on the other side, and not because I want to compare. Let's say, you know, are we uh, agreeing uh, appropriate fee levels, etc. Because that can be uh, really dependent on on the deal or situation, but this document that is precedent document has a clause x y and z we don't have that here why we don't have that you know and that just introduces that opportunity to ask a question have we forgotten it or is this not uh, relevant or is uh, uh the other side trying not to introduce that conversation and and that can be uh, a quite uh uh you know, a game changer uh, when 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 that happens, uh, for example. So 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 that would definitely be something that uh, uh, I would I, I would do right away. Yeah, that's great. I love that practical advice because it's not so simple, so effective, but perhaps something that people wouldn't even consider. So that was really cool. One thing then was you your early career was spent in DCM. Now, yeah. when you search online about DCM, you can kind of get the description of what the job is. Stephen talks about it a little bit. What I would love to know is something that you can't find when you search on the internet, which is what is the reality of facilitating that role? Because I know when yeah. I did catch up with you maybe a few years ago, you were kind of traveling like crazy. And, and perhaps that's something that people don't consider. So yeah. what, what were some of the highlights of good things and some of the things that maybe people haven't thought of when they think DCM? Yeah, I think um, DCM uh, is just as a quick recap, it's a product team within investment banking machine, right? It's a way how companies uh, raise that essentially. Um, it's a you, typically part of a broader um, division um, at the investment banks, which is capital markets. And that includes equity, that includes uh, projects, let's say debt, that includes all various other things. So you are essentially a piece of a uh, broader puzzle. And I think capital markets themselves, and especially the capital markets are great place for people that like little bit higher tenacity and velocity of the deals because deals in the capital markets would last anywhere from few months to few days, right? A repeated issuer that does a bond every year, let's say, or, or multiple times a year would uh, have 
a lot of, let's say, work in terms of documentation, et cetera, and infrastructure internally set up so that they can execute very opportunistically depending on the market. So if you like to see a lot of end-to-end -end projects through, then that's an excellent um, place for you to to start or to dedicate your career to. And inherently, you will have uh, a lot of exposure um, to clients, I think, from, from, from day one. For me personally, it was um, uh, assisted by being in an emerging market where the exposure is even even larger. Uh, the, the teams are a little bit leaner on the investment bank, banking side, but also on the client side, you would have much leaner teams. Whereas here in Europe, uh, large repeated issuers, big companies would have their own capital markets teams, which would have analysts, associates, etc. So you would not perhaps directly interact with the treasurer but for example, in 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 Hong Kong, where I was based, um, for a period of time, I was covering uh, Singaporean banks, uh, issuing across senior and bank capital, and there we would speak directly to the treasurer, almost on a daily basis when he was in a, a deal context. So, so I think the exposure to to the, to the clients directly is slightly higher there than in a traditional. Um, M&A and uh, investment banking. Um, of course, it can be situation and team dependent, but I think those would be quite uh, big advantages. And, and you get to see a lot of companies, right? Because if you are an M&A or investment banking division analyst or associate, you might get deployed in a, one deal that is taking a year or more. And so you will interact with one client in one sector, let's say, or subsector, <clears throat> and with one type of a company. So you might not even get exposure to a lot of other things uh, until uh, for some years down the line. Whereas in debt capital markets, you know, you are typically subclassified to investment grade or high yield, and maybe corporates and financial institutions, but within investment grade corporates you could be looking at you know a chemical company tmt um oil and gas anything um so just that exposure to different things is is, is much broader and if you're an individual that is more uh focused on the variety rather than depth of detail uh that's it's it's a great place for you and what about not to put you under too much pressure, but what what what's like the biggest challenge then of doing yeah. that? Is it just literally the intensity can get pretty hardcore sometimes, and then just keeping pace? I think that's definitely um, item to highlight. If you struggle with planning your day almost hour to hour, minutes to minute, it can be a tricky. Um, role because when there are life deals and life pitches etc um i remember planning my days in in different time zones because you would be uh, working on a deal that is uh, you know for let's say uh, a tie issuer so they would be in a different time zone then you are working also with london <clears throat> colleagues because you are issuing a euro uh, so it's sold to the European investors. So that time zone and and plan each of the calls for the right parties, right? So so if you love that, if you love planning and uh, organizing to really tiny tiny detail, uh, again it's a great role. Uh, if not, it might be a, a challenge. I think when I say multitasking, uh, I mean switching from one task to another very quickly. Um, it's a great skill to have in, in this kind of a job. It, it can get quite busy. Um, and personally, I, I would say consideration was that I actually understood uh, after a couple of years that I would 
really like to go a little bit deeper in terms of details about you know what the company does uh, where and how the value is actually generated um, and in the dev capital markets you don't necessarily get that because you are more focused on the product itself so the bond and on the process right raising that bond it's more of a capital market oriented because the company itself more most often times have its credit rating it's been around so investors know the company more or less so it, there is much less of actual uh credit specific work um in some high yield uh, sub investment grade uh, bonds that might be more relevant where you would calculate a little bit the impact of the bond that you would be raising but to be honest um, at least in my experience we often had the investment banking team assist on that <clears throat> piece of analysis so as a product team you wouldn't really get involved that much in in that actually that was a uh, uh, a trigger point in my career where I realized that actually I would really love to do that analysis myself and understand what the company does more. It was specifically um, inaugural bond, uh, rated bond, sorry, for Lenovo, the company maker, right? And we have been working on it, <clears throat> on it in Asia. We have done some unrated bonds for them before. But now there was this massive rating exercise where a company has to open itself up a little bit more and you need to assess what are their leverage ratios, etc. Uh, and so that was super interesting for me. But at the same time, we worked together with uh, ratings and investment banking team. So me personally, I was more focused on actual the, you know, the, the depth uh product the bond product and and the process how to originate that you know who are the best investors which is cool work and it's great i loved doing that for two years or so but that was a little bit of a point where i was when i thought i would really love uh to understand more of the details uh that's that's underpin the, the that value of, of of a company cool so so perhaps we could talk a little bit about um, something that a lot of students going into banking aspire to do, which is this transition going from a sell side investment bank doing this kind of, I guess it's a little bit Chinese whispers. It's like, oh, you do two <laughs> or three years and then you just go and work on the buy side. So just yeah. walk me through what is that? What, how closely is the reality to this perception that a lot of students at university have? And then we could move on into the differences in culture and working life and balance yeah. between the two. I would say it's much harder than it sounds. Um, certainly in this market, uh, if the market is great and there is a lot of transactions, etc., it's very easy and natural to make the transition. But I think we have come out from the macro backdrop of, let's say, uh, virtually free money. And it would be some time before we return there, if we ever return there. So if you don't have really a strong market backdrop when you are making the switch, it's not as easy, especially not to get the, let's say, the best spots. Uh, in the best places so i would say careful with kind of that plan you, you you can always have it in the back of a mind and eventually you can make that switch but it's harder than it than it seems and when you are working investment banking pace let's say um there will come uh, a time where you have to do a lot of sacrifice in terms of energy time and everything to make that switch <clears throat> but uh, generally I would I would say it's possible um, and I think starting in investment banking gives quite a good solid base in terms of broader and general knowledge because a lot of the private equity funds right 
um, well, majority of, of the funds are very specialized in terms of what they do, right? Do they do TMT? What specifically within TMT sector are they doing? What kind of strategy? Is it buyouts? Is it, you know, is it distress? Is it, um, is it actually private credit, right? So I think a, a broader knowledge base and exposure to things is very beneficial to understand yourself mostly, right? Who am I as, as a person? What excites me the most? Is it, you know, really the M&A deals or is it more of a kind of a closer to venture capital where I like to see an idea with uh, uh, in, in an investment and see it grow over time or is it more transactional? So I think starting in investment banking uh, broadly is is uh is is great however at the same time if you really know already as a student for whatever reason a family background or you met somebody from private equity industry and you just really want to do that for sure 100 percent, i think today there are avenues to skip to that point directly a lot of the major largest uh, houses have their own internships these days and they can potentially get you back full time as well. So if you really know that that is something that you want to do, you might not need uh, to to go through the uh, usual two to three years because once you have done those two to three years, you typically come into private equity industry as an analyst in any case. So um, you could be better off going going in directly. Um, but I think as a student, um, even though you might have a strong opinions within your P network or uh, your family or, or whoever it is that tells you to specialize earlier, I think it's a quite of a, a ambitious approach to say that you know yourself and and you know that this is what I want to do and I guarantee you that um, it will change in the, in in the first three to five years of the career there are ex exceptions but I think it's good to understand and realize the student that you are at in 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 a time of your life where you will change a lot your perception of things your opinions will change a lot so to keep that flexibility uh, in in one's career i think it's it's very it's it's very useful I, I always find talking to students that they they seem to think that once you get into private equity then it's kind of feet on the table i've been exhausted for three years now i can relax <laughs> and let the money roll in but i'm assuming the higher ticket that you can have in remuneration in pe comes with a different degree of expectation. So can you explain to me a little bit more about A, that work-life balance differential between the sell side, buy side, but then also why is it then in PE it's so sought after and what is it then that, that is the level yeah. of expectation? That What is the pressure? Yeah, um, yeah, good question because um, I understand that every industry from time to time becomes the, you know, the sexy thing and the attractive uh, pathway to follow. I would say the differences are from experience and it might be different uh, at the different firms, but the work-life balance in terms of actually sitting in down behind a computer typing and moving the mouse, much better on the buy side. However, in terms of actual mental energy, I would say the stakes, personal stakes are higher on the buy side because if, if you are um, an advisor working for an investment bank, you are of course very invested in the transaction, but if the transaction, ha let's say happens, everything great, you close the massive multi-billion deal that you get to put on a CV, you learn a lot. Amazing, you move to the next one. However, from the investor side, the private equity side, you are putting a lot of money 
at work and you are making a, a lot of judgment calls and you will be evaluated and judged as well on your judgment calls that you made for the next years to come until the investment is realized and hopefully it performs well but along the line there will be a lot of points and situations where people will come to you and question was that really a right decision to underwrite it this way to structure it this way did the business plan go uh by the way it was structured and more the answer is always no uh hopefully it went kind of the same way or at least the key milestones were achieved or sometimes overachieved right but what i'm trying to explain is that that deal that decision lives with you almost for the rest of your life right and that's a very different pressure and that's a very different feeling um that you experience and so yes it might be uh less work let's say behind the actual computer you will do uh less slides less uh less modeling on the absolute basis although there is a lot of modeling of course on the private equity side but then you know on the weekend where you have your free time uh you know on the you know, on the random occasions the thoughts would go back to you and you would think is this the right company that we are buying is this the right building in in the real estate that i look at um is this the right location um and then when you get to the investment committee, you need to justify um, all your views and the decisions. You can't just say, oh, because uh, the comps and the precedents average in, in, in this number. So we go with this number. There has to be a broader story. There has to be broader um, thought process behind it. So it's a very uh, different mindset, I would say. Uh, between between the two. Okay, well, look, coming coming to the end of the conversation, I don't know how far you you've thought about this, but I'd love to know. Look, so we started back in 2016. Let's say mm. when we first interacted. Here we are, almost 10 years down the line. What do you reckon, Philip, in 10 years' time will be? <laughs> Amazing questions. Like as always, uh, Anthony. Um, well, the honest answer is, I don't know the actual answer. Um, do I have a plan? Most definitely. Yes. Um, I personally work with a career and, and life coach to kind of nail that down. And I feel that at the moment I'm in a great place with a lot of potential upside if things go very well in my current firm. And so I definitely want to see um, that realize and, and, and see how far we can go. And uh, ultimately, I think, you know, in the investment and product, the business is, uh, is an arena that presents a lot of attractive, um, you know, upsides along the way, if you pay attention and if you play smart. So look, the, the founder, CEO uh, of, of, of the firm that I work for, right, started the firm after uh, years of experience uh, working for somebody else in the private equity industry. So, you know, that's kind of a, a more entrepreneurial journey it is, is on the table along the line, uh, whether it's on a more general basis right you you know you can start your own fund looking at uh value add opportunistic strategy or maybe it can be something more specific right there is a big theme of being more specialized in the private equity these days and focusing on one niche subsector because for example those individuals have acquired a large amount of assets within a platform that then may, may potentially spin out. So there is a lot of interesting things on the table. And at the same time, you gain a lot of uh, experience to think like an entrepreneur, because at the end of the day, that's what you are. 
just with somebody else's money and uh, uh, interacting with uh, hopefully a very smart management team. But at the end of the day, you make the most important calls at the beginning and throughout the journey. So you get exposure to that thinking process. And I think in in a long, long term, I would love to explore that entrepreneurial side, um, creating something uh, of my own, whether it's uh, whether it's uh, in private equity, whether it's a, a vertical or whether it's a, something completely uh, different as a business. But I think long term, uh, that would be very neat thing to try uh, that's, that's really cool and thank you so much philip for, for your time and you know watching your development and your journey is what makes working at amplify me so fulfilling and you know going we met for lunch what two or three weeks ago and having yeah. what was then the student take me out for lunch <laughs> that's just when you know that hopefully i've done a good job and that person's outperformed me and then uh you know long may that trajectory continue so thank you philip absolutely and you guys were instrumental in that journey as as we mentioned at the beginning so always great to to catch up and and support and and share my experience where wherever uh helpful great stuff thank you philip thank you